All right, we are concluding our series today called Flourish. And really what it's all been about is the four purposes of Cornerstone Church and really the four purposes of everyone that calls himself a believer in Jesus Christ. What it basically is, is a way of putting a handle on what God has called us to do as a church and as a people. And we absolutely believe that you find your greatest fulfillment in achieving what God has called you to do when we all work together in what he's called us to do. And so uh, the very first week we spoke about knowing God and that the only way you and I are ever going to discover our purpose on this planet is to by knowing God. Not knowing about God, but literally knowing God in a relationship. You see, God is not interested in giving us information about himself. He wants to have a relationship with us. And that you can have a relationship, a thriving relationship. You don't have to be the Pope. You don't have to be some great pastor or some great teacher to know God. Everyone has an opportunity to know God and to grow in God. And that's one of the major purposes of our church. We want to help everyone realize that. So many times people think, well, when I, when I get my stuff together first, and then I'll get right with God, I've got to do this, this, and the other, and I'll try this, this, and the other, and then I'll go to church, and then I'll get myself right, but first I need to do a little cleaning up. The good news is he loves you just the way you are. You don't have to clean up first. All you have to do is say, hey, God, I want to serve you. I want to love you and give your life to God wherever you're at. You don't have to first get it together. Isn't that good news? Religion says you got to do this, 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 and and then God might accept you. Truth of the matter is he accepts you through Jesus Christ. The Bible says those who call upon the Lord will be saved. And so it's all about knowing God through Jesus Christ, the purpose of our church and the purpose of every believer is to help people come to know God. That's how we become the people we're called to become. First of all, that's the most important thing. It's called salvation. And so we talked about that that first week. The second week, we talked about finding freedom. And the truth is, God does save us, no doubt about it. But there is a process of becoming what God has called us to become. Because a lot of us have things in our past and situations that have influence upon us. And so what we want to do is find the freedom that what God has called us to do. And many people in the church, they, they give their lives to Christ. They want to find freedom. I got issues to work on. And if you have a lot of issues, it requires tissues, right? And so I got a lot of issues to work on. And we think, I got to change this. I got to change that. I'm going to go to church. And I, I'm going to maybe ask someone to pray for me. I'll just get enough strength to get through the week. And then I got I to get rid of all this stuff I got in my life. And, and I, just, I just pray that I, I do okay. And a lot of people in the Bible, a lot of people in the Bible, um, have found this until God changed her life. And many times you and I can just be all about, I got to know Jesus Christ, I got to get rid of the junk so God likes me better. Because he doesn't like me very much the way I am right now. And we think that's what it's all about. But really, it's, it's beyond that. George Barner, as I mentioned last week, 87% of the church has not found the purpose why they are on the planet. Many times we just want to get free of junk and try not to hurt anybody or get hurt ourselves. And many times we think that way. In fact, a lot of the church believes that we just got to hold on and pray for Christ to come back soon because the world's going to hell in a handbasket, right? And we just think we got to wait for him to come back, but that's not the reason we're here. God does not have us here just to hold on for him to come back. We're called to make a difference in the world. And so we have to find freedom. And so how do we find freedom? We find freedom by discovering our purpose, if, imagine this, Michael Jordan, the greatest, perhaps the greatest basketball player that ever was, if not that, he's like the Babe Ruth of basketball. Imagine Michael Jordan in the 1980s and early 90s, all he wanted to do was practice ba- basketball and work on his craft, but he doesn't want to join a team. How good would he be? Right? The reason why he practices all the things, the reason he worked out and did all the things he did is so he could be on a winning team and make a difference. He had a purpose. Many times we tell you in church, you got to read your Bible, you got to pray more, come to church, help the poor. Uh, when the Salvation Army guy rings the bell, drop some coins in. You know, that's what it's all about. <laughs> I got to do good things. And it's all about the things that you have to do. And then we get this huge book that's written in a weird language, and you have to follow everything it says. And you have to smile when you're doing it. <laughs> and you're like, thanks a lot. But it isn't about that. It's like a a Michael Jordan or an athlete, all they're doing is preparing themselves for the game, but they never get in the game. The reason why we do all these things is that we can make a difference. And a lot of people don't know. And as a result of not having a purpose in your life, you find false purposes. 
Because you and I are created for passion. We're created to make a difference. We're created to have a reason to live. And if we can't find a reason, we'll find a substitute reason. And believe me, there's a lot of people out there that want to give you a substitute reason because it makes them money. It's called advertisement. So what do we do? It's sadly, a lot of people don't know why they're alive. And what we really want to do is to discover purpose. Why am I alive? Why am I here? Why did God design me? Am I here just to make money, put the kids through college, and, and uh, get a place in Florida, a condo, or buy a beach, and die? Is that why I'm alive? You know, my, my uncle just passed away yesterday, 90 years old, and, and, and fought in World War II. And you think about it, you know, we're all getting there. And my, you know, my dad is, is 80, and they, did it, they were here the first service. You missed them. Uh, they're, now they're driving home. But nevertheless, but he says, it's kind of sad. My four sisters have died. And now my uh, three brothers have died. There's only two left, me and my older brother. Is that all there is to it? Of course not. There is something more to live. And we need to discover a purpose of why we live because we're designed on purpose. Everything God does is a purpose. Remember we mentioned the fact that there are accidental parents, but there's no accidental children. We believe that God has a purpose for everybody. And when you discover that, that's one of the purposes of our church is to help you find God, know God, right? To help find freedom. And freedom happens by connecting to God and connecting to his body. We find freedom by being connected to his body. Because if you ever hurt your hand and you have a cut on your hand, you know how you get healed? Your body will heal the body. And we're called to be part of that. So we need to discover purpose. We have something called growth track, which is just a beginning. It's not the end all get all, but it's a beginning. Where we help you find to know God, we help you to discover your purpose and get connected. We'll talk more about that in a few moments. And then finally, uh, we want to make a difference. We want to discover purpose. Now we discover the purpose. Now why am I here for? You're here to make a difference in the world. Who, me? Yes, you. Well, how do we do that? You see, God always intended to have you live a life of fulfillment. That's what God wanted to do. You know, the Bible says in John 10.10, 10, the Bible says the following, the thief, which is the enemy, does not come except to steal and to kill. We mentioned the very second week we hit to find freedom because we are fighting against an enemy. There are spiritual forces in the different realms that are fighting to stop you from becoming what God has called you to become. And we are fighting against that. And the truth is a thief does not come except to steal and to kill and destroy. But what did Christ come for? What do we see in the world? Killing, destroying, right? We see a lot of turmoil. Why did Christ come? I have come that they may have Zoe. They may have life in its fullness. They may have it more abundantly. Now, this abundant life does not mean that we get richer quicker and have more stuff. No, it's not about that. It's about that you and I would become what God has called us to be. Living that abundant life, my friends, is knowing why you're here and becoming and beginning to do it. Where, aha, this is the reason I'm alive. And really, God desires for you and I to know that. And make no mistake, there are different seasons of your life. And sometimes, I do want to say this, I think sometimes people get really frustrated because they have a dream to do something, and they're in their 20s, and they're not doing it yet, and they're frustrated, and they give up. But you have to understand, there's God's timetable. And the beautiful thing is, God will give us what we need for today to get us to the next place. One of the greatest scriptures in the, in the Bible, as far as I'm concerned, about personal direction is found in John, as Matthew 6, 33. Seek first, I'm sorry, um, John 6, um, 6.33, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, right? And all these things will be added. Well, God will show you day by day what you're to do. And there's different seasons or different situations. But the beautiful thing is God will show you. He will show you enough to do to get to the next place. You see, the enemy has a dream and God has a dream for your life. And God wants us to have fullness then why do we not have fullness in our life? Why are there so many people just trying to get by, trying not to sin, trying not to, oh, I hope God likes me, I, I got a bad past. How do we really find purpose? How do we really make a difference? How do we find for fullness? Well, one of the reasons why we don't find fullness is because many of us live by looking in the past. Maybe you've made mistakes in the past. Well, if you're a human being, all of us have made mistakes. Sometimes we let our past cripple us from seeing our future. 
and past mistakes, perhaps a past divorce or divorces or, or situations. You were involved with drugs or you were involved with all kinds of uh, illegal activity or immoral lifestyles and perhaps things that are shunned by people. And if anyone knew what I was really like, they would want nothing to do with me. And you had this shame and you feel like I, I just got to, you know, I don't want anyone to know what's going on. And you got to be careful, of course, who you tell. But the truth of the matter is our past does not define us. Your sin does not define you. Your Savior defines you. Let me say that again. Your sins do not define you. Your Savior defines you if you give your life to Christ and ask him to take away your sins. Your past is your past. But the most important thing is what you do from this point forward. And God has good plans for you. We define ourselves by the past. The Bible says in, in uh, Psalm 38.4, my guilt has overwhelmed me like a burden too heavy to bear. I am bowed, verse 6, I am bowed down and brought low. You just have this guilt upon you, and there's no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. He does not want you walking around with, I made so many mistakes. Now, there are a lot of people out there that will remind you of your past mistakes, won't they? I'm married to one. Well, that's another time. Why? And you know, sometimes also, sometimes our biggest, our biggest enemy is the past. Not because of just our mistakes, but also because of our successes. Because I've been successful, and the truth is, they've done studies, and uh, sociological studies, and, and this is what they found. Most people do not like change. 80% of the American culture, or culture in general, does not like change. We, we say we're bored, we like change, but the truth is we don't like change. And what happens, we find success, and it ain't broke, I ain't going to fix it, right? This thing's working, I'm not going to change it. But the truth is, God has called us to go from one of my pet things I say, you'll hear me say it from time to time, God has called us to go from glory to glory, not to stay in the same old story. And we get comfortable. In fact, in church history, the great movements of God that took place, God would do a tremendous work, and the people would find God's purpose for their generation. And then what would happen is they'd stay there. And then the next generation comes, and God would bring them to another, another place of his grace. And they would criticize and persecute the next move of God because this is the way we've always done it. This is the way we've always done it stops God from doing what he wants to do in our lives. And so what we have to do is sometimes our past failures and our past successes. You cannot drive a car well by looking, uh, looking in the back. When I grew up, I had a friend of mine. His name was, uh, should I say, I'll say his first name. In case he's watching by some remote chance. His name is Sean. And his mother was not the greatest driver in the world. The father was constantly replacing the cars and this and the other. And, and this is nothing sexist. It's just, just a, this is just the truth, okay, about this particular person. And so I'd be driving in the back seat. This is before we had seat belts. And this is before, you know, this has been the old days when you used to just, uh, no car seats, nothing. And she'd be driving the car. And she said, well, how you doing, Eric? And she'd turn around while she's driving on the highway and, and look at me and like, uh-uh, I'm doing fine. And, we, and then she'd be swerving around. And I said, no, I'm not going to ride with her anymore. Because she kept turning around and having a conversation with what's behind her. Many of you are driving your life and having conversations with your past. And it's veering you off the path. And something about the religious makeup of us from religion feels, if I feel bad about my past, God's happy with that because it means I'm really sorry. Well, some of you are parents and are guardians. If your kids are walking around constantly saying, oh, I've got an F in my report card. How you doing, Johnny? I've got an F in my report card. I need to study hard. I'm so bad. I'm so bad. I'm going to go out and play. No, I just got an effort. I mean, what, you don't want that for your kid. What, what, what do you want for your children? You want your children to learn from it, to be motivated to change. God wants the same thing, right? And so we think it's, it's, it's noble to feel bad. It's not noble to feel bad. The Bible says there's no condemnation for those in Christ, all right? But there is conviction, and conviction is you can do a better job. And so many times we're living our lives by looking in the rear of our mirror, constantly having conversations with our past. As a result of that, we can't get to the destination we're supposed to get. As a result, you end up colliding in your present circumstances because you're looking behind you. We have to focus where God has placed us and what he's done for our lives. You see, this is the good news. God did not call you to be just living. 
and just getting by. God, I did not call myself to be a pastor. God called me, and I believe that. God did not call you just to live. He called you to be a person of God. He called you to make a difference in the world. Did you realize that? And so we often try that. That's the first thing, our past. The second thing that gets us is our culture. Our, cultures, our culture will tell us what we're supposed to do and how we're supposed to achieve it. Our culture will tell us what the success line is, and this is the end game. This is, the end, this is, this is how you score. This is the, what you're supposed to do. And there's millions of voices telling you what you're to do from your mother-in-law. I'm just kidding. When you hear laughter, it means there's truth in it. Okay. There are people that want to tell you what to do, isn't there? That the advertising agencies of America will tell you, unless you're to be successful, you need to live in, in this strata of society. You need to have this kind of job, drive this kind of car. Your child should be in this program or the other program. I mean, I was just talking to a friend of mine uh, this past week, and Arnold, and we were talking about... Um, well, I'm talking about pools and solar panels. Well, solar panel, if one, one, someone on the block gets a solar panel, the next day the whole block gets it. Have you noticed that? We just copy each other. Nothing wrong with solar panels, but I'm just saying, if you drive through a neighborhood, you'll see one, and you'll see a whole bunch together. We like to copy each other. We try to copy each other all the time. That's not the goal, is to be like your neighbor. And this is the problem is this. Our society tells us so many things that you can never become what you want to become. Styles change. Situations change. And you can waste your entire life trying to be what someone else wants you to be. And this is the problem. You and I don't realize that our culture affects us more than we think it does. It does. Our culture has a tremendous effect upon us. It's called secondhand culture. You've heard of secondhand smoke? It's called secondhand culture. Our culture affects us. The people you hang out with affects you. Why? We're created for community. And what happens is people affect you. The Bible says, do not be deceived. Evil company corrupts moral character. Do not hang out with an angry man unless you become angry. Why does the Bible say that? It says, join yourself with other believers. And, and as you see the day approaching, the book of Hebrews, because the Bible understands, God understands that we're made to be in community, which we'll get to in a few moments. And so we often do this. We try different careers, and we try to meet our cultural standards, and it is an end game. It never, never ends. There is no end to it. Galatians 1.10 says the following. It's the Apostle Paul saying. I love how the New Living Translation translates it. I think it does a good job here. Obvious, and people, are, I'll just stop here for a second. You might wonder, why do you use so many different translations? Well, just as a little side note, the Bible was written in, um, was written in Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek. And what they did is they translated it to English. And so what I often do is I'll go back to their, I'm not a Greek scholar, but I'll go back and look at the original meaning and pick out the translation that says it the best so I don't have to, it helps save time. Does that make sense? Okay, so this is why we do what we do. So many people ask me that. Now back to our scheduled program. Uh, Galatians 1.10. Obviously, I'm not trying to win the approval of people. <laughs> well, it's not so obvious for us, is it? Many of us are trying to win the approval of other people. Do you know what that equals? Misery. It is. It, you'll never be satisfied. The world's standards... There's millions of voices out there telling you what to do. And if you try to follow everything that someone tells you, you go crazy. You see, the world will complicate your life, but God will simplify your life. He's asked you to do one thing, to love God, to love yourself and God, and love each other. And that's so simple. When you do the Lord's way, it simplifies your life, and it makes clarity for your life. Obviously, Galatians 1.10, I'm not trying to win the approval of people, but of God. If pleasing people were my goal, I would not be Christ's servant. You can't serve God and serve people without God. I know it sounds noble to serve people, but if you're serving people's opinions, our culture's opinions, you cannot serve God. You cannot have two masters. And so we have to make a decision. I'm going to follow what God tells me to do, not all these other things. Otherwise, you'll be uh, pulled to and fro from different ways. And you have to recognize the fact, my friends, that your culture does affect you. And if you don't realize that, then you're probably being affected more than you do. Realize it. That's the second thing. The third thing, how do we change this? It's called discovery. We want to find what you're good at. That's what we talked about. Find what you're designed to do. Find why God has created you. Why God has put you on the planet. And the beautiful thing is this. God desires for you to be who he's created you to be. 
And when you and I stop trying to be somebody else and start being the person that God's created us to be, when we start competing with each other and start completing each other, if someone else's child's doing better than mine in school, instead of saying, well, I must be a bad parent, there's something wrong with me, I gotta find something wrong with that person to criticize them, or that other person gets into a college or university you can't get into, I gotta find something wrong with that person because I can't get in that university, and I don't want that person to succeed because that makes me look like I'm bad. Who said it makes you look bad? Why not say, that's fantastic. You're going to Yale University, you're gonna be a millionaire one day, you're gonna give me a lot of money, thank you. Why do we have to do that? Why can't we say, praise God, your child's doing great in school, or why not, you, go on the, you got that pay raise, why not be happy about it? You know what happens when you're happy about it and you celebrate someone else's success? It creates an environment that this person's pleasant to be with. I wanna bless them. That's just in the natural realm. You put that in a supernatural realm where you're helping people to discover what God's created them to do. And so we want, we wanna help the church discover what they're called to do. You see, one of the things we see happen, it's very interesting, uh, just recently we got a keyboard stand because we used to put it on a little table, and uh, my father couldn't figure it out and I couldn't figure it out, how to put it together. I even went on YouTube. But there was a person in my house, five years old, put it together. <laughs> Matthew, my five-year-old son, could figure out, my, my fa- I shouldn't tell him about my father. I'm sorry, Dad. He's not even, see, if the parents were here, wouldn't say it. But they could, my five-year-old son could figure it out. Why? He's obviously, he's good, he's gifted, but he has more of an engineer's mind than me. So instead of being upset about it, praise God, there's someone in the house, I'll have to wait a little longer before he can start doing stuff around the house, but why not find your gift and celebrate your gift and celebrate someone else's gift? Isn't that, isn't that great to do that? How frustrating is it to try to be somebody else? Or, or, or Who said if someone's successful, you're not? The, the real successful people in life are like God. They want to celebrate other people's success. And real success is knowing what God's plan is for your life and achieving it by his power. So we have a, something here at Cornerstone where we believe a family is a place where you can learn your gifts, right, in, in the natural realm? Well, in the church, it should be the same way. And when we work together, we can begin to find our gifts, that's why it's important to be connected to each other. And we have, a situ- we have something called Grove Track, which is just a little way for us to get connected, where you get connected to God, discover your purpose. We give you a personality test to show you how you can fit into the body. We want to see you serve together, and we'll get more about service a little later on. We want to get rid of the mind- mentality that it is a, I got to do my job. No, you get to serve, which is bringing us to the next thing. Discovering what your God's called you to do. I love what it says in 2 Timothy 1.9. I'm, I'm using the message here. This is a complete paraphrase, okay? But I'll read this one first. For God saved us and called us to live a holy life. You know what holy means? It means perfect. It means righteous. It means the right way to do things. That's what it means. It doesn't mean boring and you can't do anything. It means you actually live to the fullness. Called a holy life. He did not... He did this not because we deserved it, but because it was his plan from the the beginning of time to show us his grace through Jesus Christ. And so God has a purpose, and he wants to show his grace through you and through I. I like what the Apostle Paul said in Acts 20, 24. This is what he said. But my life is worth nothing to me unless I use it for finishing the work assigned me by the Lord Jesus Christ. The work of telling others the good news about the wonderful grace of God. The apostle Paul had a laser vision. He was very satisfied with his life. No circumstances could take him off. He could be thrown in prison and beat up and he'd still be praising God. Why? He had a purpose. He had a solidarity of his life. Well, how do we make a difference? How do we make a difference? Because we're called to do that. Let me tell you the, the, the punchline before the joke, okay? You make a difference by serving God and serving each other. Okay, not boring. Well, let me explain this. We make a difference by serving others, but there's one little problem. Have you guys noticed that people are a pain? <laughs> I had a pastor friend of me that told me this. He says, I would love the ministry in the church if it wasn't for people. <laughs> people are a pain. They are. And guess what? Sometimes you're the pain. People are difficult because you're difficult. But people are what Jesus Christ died for and loves them so much. And everything worthwhile takes sacrifice and there's a bit of risk involved. 
But people are made in God's image. And God has called us to work together. And we're, our mar- and marriage is the most wonderful thing that I've ever experienced. Is it work? No, not for me. It's work for Sandra. It's not the easiest thing in the world, but it brings great rewards. Okay? Children are a great, great blessing. It's a lot of hard work, right? Okay? People are... So, this is, this is the truth. You can never be fulfilled by yourself. You know why? You weren't created to live by yourself. You just were not created that way. You and I were created to be in community. This is how we've been designed. From the very beginning, from the moment you get out of your mother's womb, there is a design for connection, isn't there? They've seen horrible things in, in orphanages in like Romania where children were not nurtured and were not held and they end up dying or, or not developing like they should. They were handicapped, not because of genetic codes. They were handicapped because of not having interaction and love. You see, you can't be fulfilled by yourself. And not, it's not that I don't have problems and you don't have problems, but when we have a purpose together, we can overlook those problems because we're going for something greater. And that purpose is to love God and to love each other. I like what Abraham Maslow, you might have heard this when you grew up in school, Maslow's hierarchy of needs in 1948, they started this whole thing. And really, the truth of the matter is this, science and sociology, sociology is the study of humanity, all right? You have science, science is the discovery of what God has made. Sometimes they get it right, sometimes they get it wrong. And so science should really help explain what God has done. And there is social science. And it's very true when you look at Maslow's hierarchy of needs. What is it? Well, the first one is this. There's eight of them, all right? Uh, they've advanced them even after Maslow died because he didn't find his purpose. Uh, the first one is this. The first primary need that you and I have is, is called physical needs. We need air, <laughs> we need water, and we need food. We don't care about football games. We don't care about anything else but those two things, don't we? We don't care about if I have a meaningful job. If you can't eat, you can't live, nothing else matters, right? So that's the physical need. That's the first one. The second one we need is safety needs, they say. Are we protected? Do I have a roof over my head? Am I protected? Am I in a safe place? So we have your physical needs met and you feel protection. You get to the next place. The next one is, number three, is love needs. We have a desire to love and to be loved. It is scientifically proven that mankind needs love. Babies do not thrive or survive without love. And so that's part of it. We want to be loved and show love. That's the third need. The fourth need is this, esteem needs. We need to be, we need a good old attaboy once in a while, don't we? We need to know we're achieving something. We need to know, we need to get feedback from other human beings saying, hey, you're doing a good job, Right? Come on, we all need it. We do. So please, esteem me. No, um. Then we also have this. And so the first four are basically the, the basic way to be alive. Just to, just to kind of get to a place where you can live a relatively, um, uh, these are the foundation points which, in which the rest of it's built. Those are the fundamental needs. Then you have, after that, you have the fulfillment needs, which are the next four. And what's the fifth one is cognitive needs. And that's the needs to understand. Why does the planet spin this way? What is over on the other universe? How does a bird do? You know, we want to know stuff, don't we? I mean, we watch Animal Planet. <laughs> we want to know why things do, what, how do things work? We want to know why things happen. We have this d- desire to know. It's a cognitive need. It's a need to understand. We have needs to grow. It's something that God has given us. All right? That's the fifth one. The sixth one is aesthetic need. We like beautiful things. That's why I married my wife, Sandra, right? So uh, and we, we like beautiful things. We like to see things. We like to go to art. We like to see movies, plays. We like to hear music. We like to see great sport teams. We like aesthetic beauty. And then this number seven was, they thought, the pinnacle. And that's called self-actualization. This is when all the other needs are being met. So now you're at a place where you can care. If you're in another country, for example, and you're going through famine, they really don't care about finding their life goal, right? All they want to do is get food for their family and survive. But when all these needs are met, then you can have self-actualization. Wow, now I discovered the reason I'm really alive. And now I'm self-actualizing. I was called to be a, a... a doctor, I was called to be a dentist. Remember from the Rudolph the Red News Reindeer? I've been watching a lot of these programs lately. Okay, I'm sorry. It's great having children because you get to relive your youth. I want to be a dentist. Okay. 
Next week, we'll, we'll, we'll sing the song, I Don't Want to Be a Misfit. Okay, let's just move, let's move forward. I'm sorry about that. It's a little, uh, little break there. But we have a self-actualization. And they thought this was the real reason people were alive. If you read self-actualization, you finally got it. But they found that was not the one. Through studies, they said, no, that is not working. There is another reason why. There's beyond that. People uh, not only need self-actualization, but they need to have a legacy. They need to have something beyond themselves. You know what they call that? Transcendent needs. Transcendence needs. We have a desire to live a life beyond yourself. You know what's amazing about this? This kind of explains what the Bible says. Do you realize that? The Bible says we are a body. We are, how do we become the no Christ? We are to be fitted and joined together as a body and that we would grow up into completeness and the fullness of what Jesus Christ is himself. How does that happen? It happens by working in community. How do you do that? To make a difference in the world. We're called not only to be connected, but we're called to make a difference beyond ourselves. And the problem is our culture tells us, be happy for yourself. Get, 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 get. Buy more stuff, get more stuff, and then you'll be happy. And we run after this carrot, and we never achieve it. Why? Because you and I are not called just to get stuff and just to be happy. We're called to work together to make a difference beyond ourselves. Why is it that even atheists We'll give money away to the poor. Why is it they're so interested about climate change and helping the refugees and all that? And that's all good. Why? Because they want to help somebody else because there's something in mankind that says, I'm supposed to help somebody else beyond myself. And we get a charge from it. I feel better about myself. Why? Because you're designed not to live for yourself. You're designed ultimately to live for God. And guess who God loves a lot? Yes, he also loves people. For God so loved the what? The world. And so when we love God, one of the greatest gifts we can give God is loving the people he died for. And that's, that's called transcendent needs. And so the ultimate fulfillment is making a difference together. And so this is, what, this is what it's all about. This is how we find our purpose, my friends. This is the highest level of existence is when you finally get to the place, it's not about you. It's about loving God, loving other people, and working together to make a difference. We are created to be in the community. I don't know if you realize that. We're not created to do it all by ourselves. We're created to work together. And so people lose their way when they don't know why. How does that work? How do we do that? We need, to, we need to stop with the me and turn to we. You've heard that before, haven't you? Turn the M upside down, and we need to turn it to the we factor, which we become what we're called to become together. We and I are incomplete. Do you realize the fact, as I mentioned last week, I listened to it, I'm like, oh boy, it's a little tough, but it's true. Many people in the church, what they've done is they've, put, they've basically decapitated Christ. They cut the head off from the body. All I need is Jesus and me. It sounds wonderful, but the truth of the matter is Jesus' body is the church here on the planet. And you and I will never become what he's called us to become until we are connected, not only to the head. That's essential. Without the head, everything dies. But we must be connected to the body. How does that happen? Jesus said this, a new commandment I give you John 13, 34, a new commandment I give you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this, all will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. It doesn't say go out and share the gospel with the whole world by yourself. It doesn't say give your money to the poor. And what does it say? Now, all that's good, but it says you are to love one another as I've loved you. It's out. Uh, how is the world going to like the church or become part of the church when they see the beautiful body of Christ? When you and I become about loving each other and caring about each other, instead of competing against each other, we complete each other. Instead of trying to be better than somebody else, you try to help them become better. There's an old illustration I heard a number of years ago about a man who went to heaven and hell. And the first place he went to was hell. And he was absolutely surprised because he smelled, he, he smelled incredible food wafing in the air. 
It was beautiful. He saw this long table full of scrumptious food, but he heard a wailing and a crying. And it was, it was horrific sounds that it just made him, his, his fear go up to the top. He got to the huge table, thousands and thousands of people. The table goes as long as the eye can see. And there's scrumptious food steaming and fresh and ready. And people have these chopstick arms and they're trying to feed themselves. And they're the living dead. They're skeletons that are crying out in anguish because they're trying to feed themselves. But they can't because their arms are too long. Then he goes to a place called heaven. And he sees the same sunset, sees the same table, sees the same scrumptious food, and smells the waff of the beautiful food. I know you guys are getting hungry. I'm sorry. But he hears laughter. He hears joy. He hears celebration. And what he sees as he gets closer, he sees the people with the long chopstick arms feeding each other instead of trying to feed themselves. Now, I know that's not scriptural, but the illustrating point's a good point. That you and I are designed to bless each other and love each other. And it works tremendously when we're connected to God. Now, it says in Matthew 16, 18, Now I say to you, Peter, which means rock, upon this rock I will build my church, and the powers of hell will not conquer it. It does not say, Peter, all by yourself, you're going to conquer. It says, no, Peter, on this rock I will build my church. Ecclesia, those that are called out, people working together. And what's God's desire? Do you know what God's desire for your life is? I don't know if it's in the scriptures there. John 15, 8 says this. When you produce much fruit, you're my true disciples, and this brings great glory to my Father. From the very beginning, the Bible says, be fruitful and multiply and subdue. God wants us to be fruitful and multiply his purposes on the planet to make a difference. You see, you and I are called not to live by ourselves. Now, this is the beautiful thing. Everyone can be a smashing success in the kingdom of God. Once you get your eyes off your neighbor and trying to be your neighbor or trying to be some other thing, and you start saying, God, how have you designed me? God, I want to be the person you've called me to become. And our purpose is to make a difference in the world. And this is the truth. I can criticize the church. Well, the church in America today doesn't do this. The guy on TV does this wrong. The girl on TV does this wrong. And the church needs to go back to this. And I can criticize all the churches in the United States. And that's fine. That's great. It doesn't do much good. But where's my best effect for the church I am part of? What's the church I'm a part of? Cornerstone Church. And same thing with you. You're a part of this church. You can't affect the churches across the world, but what you can do is make a change here. When we all work to make a change here, and we love each other, what it does, it creates a place where people begin to find their purpose, are encouraged to make a difference in the world, and we help each other become what God's called us to become. And yes, we can change the world. Let me ask you a quick question here this morning. How many people believe that the answer to the world is for people to find Jesus Christ? Okay, two of you. Thank you so much. We have a lot of work to do, honey. No, I'm sorry. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Let me ask you a question. How many of you came to Jesus Christ because you went to a stadium event and heard an evangelist? Just look around. There's not one person here this morning. How many of you came to know Christ because of a person on television? Okay, one or two. How many of you came to know Christ because of a personal friend or a family member? Look at that. We have this idea in our mind that you need to be an evangelist. No. Do you realize that if you change one life at a time, that's how life changes? Do you realize that if you and I will love each other well and be a church? Now listen, we're not talking about an exclusive club. No. What it's about is we are about people discovering God. What's the best way people discover God? The best way people discover God is when they see a loving community that loves God and loves each other and welcomes new people and has potential and beliefs. When you love God, you will love people. If you don't like people, there's a problem in your relationship with God. Let me say it again. 
If you have a hard time loving people, there's a problem between you and God because God is crazy about people, so crazy about people that he did something extraordinary. He decided to leave heaven. He decided to become a man and he decided to come down to our level and to die and become one of us because he is so crazy in love with you and I. And if you and I love God, we should love people. And the beautiful thing is this. The beautiful thing is this, when we do that, we're fulfilled. When you do that, ah, this is why I'm alive. You become like that place where you're feeding each other and you are, you are growing. If you wanna live your life where it's all about me, I come to church, but this is too loud, this is too soft, ah, the coffee's it's too strong, coffee's too weak, I don't like this. What happens, no, there's no one like that in this church, that's the other church that I used to be a part of. What would happen if we came to church and said, you know what, I want to come, I want to bless somebody. Lord, as I go to church today, if there's someone that comes off and first person here today, I want to be a blessing to someone. Let me find, is there someone I can encourage today? And you know what we should do? This is not about us. It's about us growing together. But we want to create a place where you can invite somebody and you know they're going to be loved when they come here. That when someone walks in this room, it's not about some kind of church or some kind of pastor. No, there's a tangible love of God in this place. And what happens to you is there's something alive that comes in you. My God, I, I, I want this person to know God. I want this person to become, and this person's coming in. This person just got through a horrible divorce. This person, the other night, had a, bo a bottle of pills and was ready to end it all, but she kept driving across Cornerstone Church, and for some reason or another, wants to come in. And there's two opportunities. I'm uncomfortable talking to new people, so you talk to your friends. But what happens if you're so tuned into God, you see this young lady come in, you end up talking to her, hey, it's so great to see you here. We're so glad you're here today. How can I help you? How can I serve you? And she senses the love of God, and her life changes. We've had people come in this place. I have to be careful what I say. I'm going to be more generalized. They've come up to me, and they have said things to me. Do you love me? I've done X, Y, and Z. I've never been to church before, but I keep coming here week after week, and I cry, I don't know why. Will you love me? I said, of course I love you, because God loves you. And the person gave their life to Christ, and they brought a whole row of friends the following week. That's the place we want to create. How do we change life? How do we change this country? You know, you, being angry at the TV set and getting angry at all these politicians and shaking our fist, you know, that's fine. You can pray. But how we change, if you and I will love God, love each other, and instead of being about ourselves, start being about Him, loving God. And God's so crazy about people, He'll give you a passion for people. You'll get up in the morning and say, I want to change the world by loving people, and it's going to feel right. You're going to resonate, and you're going to find the best thing you can ever find transcendence of yourself into the purpose and mind of God. My friends, it's a place to live. And some of you know what I'm talking about. You've done it. You, you've, there's been moments in your life where you got rid of yourself and you blessed someone else and you did something without strings attached. You did it not for the applause of men or anybody else, but you did it because you wanted to bless somebody and you know the charge you got. That charge you got is your body and your spirit saying, aha, they finally got it. This is the way I've been designed. When we become a church that it's about God, it's about loving God, it's about a passion to see lives transformed and realizing that the incubator of love, how will the world know? By loving each other. And real love reaches out. Real love does not become selfish. We're not talking about sloppy agape where it's all about us and we got this big wall of fire. Someone comes in and it's all about our thing. Well, I like it this way. And you say, you know what? It's not about me. It's about me reaching somebody that never heard the gospel of Jesus Christ before. What would happen if we do that? What would happen if we parked further away so someone, someone brand new could find their way? What happens when it's not about us? I tell you what happens. You start realizing the reason why you're alive. And my friends, as you do that, and as you're faithful in that, God will bless every other area of your life because we become whole by being part of the body of Christ. Let's pray. Father, I want to thank you so much that uh, there's a reason why we're alive here, God. That you've created us to be in your image. Lord, that there's not one person hearing the sound of my voice today or later on that is not here for some sort of reason. Father, we believe 
The reason why we're alive is because there's a redemptive and there's a place and an opportunity to become what you've created us to become. Father, in Jesus' name, right now, I just pray that there will be a level of acceptance upon this place, God. Father, we thank you that you didn't die for a perfect people. You died for an imperfect, sinful, messed up people. And Father, we want to thank you that we can never earn our way to you, but you paid the price that we could be with you. And Lord, I thank you for that in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. I'm going to ask you a question, and I ask it every single week because it's the most important question you can ask. How are you with God? Do you know Jesus Christ? I'm not asking if you know about Jesus Christ. You may even have a bunch of scriptures memorized from childhood. You may have served in the church. You may be an usher, greeter. You may have been a Sunday school teacher in your previous church, whatever. You may have gone to catechism and all that. But have you, do you actually know Jesus Christ? If you don't, you can today. It's real simple. It's absolutely wonderful. You don't have to get it all together. You don't have to do this, this, and you. All you have to do is say, God, I'm, I'm, I'm coming to you right now. Now, granted, you have to be willing to release the keys of your life. You need to be willing to release your life to him and say, God, I give you my life. Okay, we're not saying you can keep it all. No, you have to, it's, it costs you everything, but it's free. <laughs> and it makes no sense at all, does it? You don't have to earn it. You don't have to pay money. All you have to do is say, God, I'm throwing my hands up. This is all yours. I can't do this anymore. My life is yours. That's all you have to do. And you can begin a new day today in Christ. There's only one way to heaven, that's through Jesus Christ. What about other religions? Every religion in the world is going to have to go through Jesus Christ. He's the only assurance of salvation. And my friends, there is an afterlife. The Bible says to be present, to be absent from the bodies, to be present with the Lord if you're with him. It's appointed a man to live once, then comes the judgment. Everyone's going to have to stand for an account of your life. Right now, you and I are an area of opportunity and grace. There's an opportunity for God, for you and God to get connected, but there's going to come a point in place, either when you die or when he comes back, where it's too late. Now is the time for opportunity. You may say, well, I'm not ready to believe yet because I got a lot of questions. That's okay. I went through that too, by the way. I had a lot of questions. I had to go through a period of discovering. And that God's cool with that. He doesn't want you to make a decision just because I tell you to make a decision. But some of you are knowing deep in your heart that God's calling. I'm going to ask you to bow your heads once again. I don't want to embarrass you or, or do anything to make you feel uncomfortable. This, it's between you and God right now. And I'm going to pray a prayer. And I'm going to pray this prayer. Uh, and if you will agree with this prayer in your heart, then I believe you can begin a new day with Christ. And it starts real simple like this. Lord Jesus, I thank you for dying on the cross for me. I believe you are the Son of God. I thank you for dying on the cross and paying for all of my sins. I ask you to forgive me of all of my sins, all the wrong things I've done, all the wrong things I've said, all the broken relationships, all the things I've done wrong. I ask you to forgive me. I lay it off to you, Lord. Forgive me of everything I've ever done wrong, both known and unknown. And this day, I finally am tired, and I recognize the fact that I want to give my life to you. I want to achieve and become what you designed me to become. I hand over the keys. I hand over the deed of my life to you right now. Come fill me right now. And by your power and by your, your help, I choose to follow you all the days of my life. With every head bowed, just quickly, can I just say a quick show of hands? Say, Pastor, that was me this morning. Anyone this morning? Say, Pastor, thank you. Anyone else? Just so I can help pray a little better for you later on. Anyone else this morning? Say, Pastor, that's me. Okay, thank you. Let's have another prayer here this morning. Let's pray for a purpose. Father, I want to thank you for Cornerstone Church. I want to thank you for these beautiful people that are here this morning. I want to thank you that every single person is here for a reason and a purpose. Father, I ask in Jesus' name that all of us would get to the place we're no longer will it be about us. But Father, we recognize we are designed to be in communication and we're designed to have a relationship that's surrendered to you. We're also designed to work together for a cause greater and bigger than ourselves. Father, I ask that you would multiply this church 
as we grow together, Father, that men and women and children would grow strong in you. Lord, I pray this would be a place where we are encouraged, where we are equipped, that lives are changed. Father, I pray that you continue to fill this place with more and more people, that more and more people come to know you. And Father, that we'd see our schools change, our workplaces change, our families change, our nation change, and yes, even the world. Father, I pray that we would have passion to follow you, that we would recognize the only way we're going to get to where we need to go is by surrendering our lives on a daily basis. Father, break our heart for what breaks yours in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's all stand if we could. I'm going to ask our prayer team to make their way down. I want to encourage you, if you haven't been through our growth track, we have essentials today right after this service. You're welcome to come. We have a few extra spots, but we want to open the areas here. This is called the altar. We call it the front of the church. If you'd like to receive prayer, we want to pray for you this morning about anything at all. We just join in together and say, Lord, we want to touch God and, and pray. Sometimes you need someone to pray with. So we want to do that this morning. We're going to have a closing song and then we're going to dismiss you, okay? bless you and let's have the Lord come in our lives let's have him come in our families let's invite him in all that we do God bless you if you need prayer come forward and the band will continue to play God bless you